I'm touching my uh, my my body with your gun. No. Okay, stay away from me now. What do you want? No, no why? It's my right. I won't go in great depth other than to say we call for things like uh, investigating and prosecuting those that are implicated in these crimes, including at the International Criminal Court. Hello, my name is Stanley Heller. Welcome to the Struggle Video News. Isa Amro lives in Hebron in occupied Palestine on the West Bank. He works with Friends of Hebron, which tries to peacefully confront Israeli apartheid authorities and their soldiers. He is constantly harassed and assaulted. Here's the latest. Don't touch me! Don't touch me! Don't touch me! We're just passing by, walking to my house. We are allowed to film the video. Delete the Many video. videos I filmed. Delete the video. No, I don't delete the video. Delete. No, I don't. <laughs> just film it and go home. Hey, hey, hey! B, hey, hey, hey! Okay, come away. Why are why you, you act like that? No, no, you are, you are touching my, uh, my, my body with your gun. Okay, stay away from me now. What do you want? No, why? It's my right. It's my right. I want to call my lawyer. Don't touch me! Hey! Leave him! For what? I want an ambulance. What's the matter with you, guy? Are you so bored? Hide the phone, hide the phone. Send the video to me. Yes, please. The only thing new about this is that Amro was giving a tour to a well-known U.S. journalist at the time of the attack, and that the Israeli authorities gave the soldier a slap on the hand, a 10-day stint in jail. CNN did a rather substantial interview of Amro. We'll link to it at the Struggle Video News and below the YouTube. Still, Amro does not feel comforted by the publicity. He says he fears for his life. You recall the killing of Yad Halak, a 32-year-old autistic Palestinian man who was murdered after he had been shot by Israeli police and rendered helpless. This happened in Jerusalem in 2020. Police chased him and shot him in the leg. His teacher tried to intervene to tell the police that he was disabled and was harmless, but they shot him dead anyway in a refuse room while he was lying on the floor. The headline here is absolutely true. When his mandatory term in the Israeli border police ended, he was rehired by the border police chief who had always defended this shooter's actions. The shooter is now a sergeant at a higher rate of pay, effectively a promotion. All this happened even though the shooter is under indictment for the killing of Halak. And we don't know the shooter's name. This is withheld by Israeli authorities. In Germany, a Jewish person who did not want to be identified is appealing a conviction by a German court for going to a rally in support of Palestinians on Nakba Day of 2022. The German government had banned the rally, giving as its reason that the crowd at similar demonstrations was from, quote, the Arab diaspora and from 
Muslim influence groups and that experience had shown that this clientele currently has a clearly aggressive attitude and is not adverse to violent action. So a Jew goes to a peaceful rally in support of Arabs and Muslims and is convicted of a crime. Welcome to Germany. A few days ago, I did a video in support of the Syria campaign's call to open all the roads from Turkey into the Idlib-Syria area. I also broached the topic of creating airports in Idlib-Syria to accept humanitarian goods. Here are parts of what I said. Nearly 12,000 people have signed an emergency petition created by the Syria campaign and directed at leaders of the United Nations. It reads, More than 3,500 people have been confirmed dead by the earthquake in Syria. It is horror beyond words, and the death toll is rising by the minute. In northwest Syria, the White Helmets are working around the clock to pull every survivor they can from under the rubble of collapsed buildings. But they're telling us that the scale of the catastrophe requires immediate international response to provide the heavy machinery and technical expertise needed on the ground. As of now, the UN has failed to activate a disaster response plan for northwest Syria. In recent years, Russia has repeatedly used its veto at the UN Security Council to reduce the number of border crossings authorized to deliver UN aid to Syria from four in 2014 to just one in 2020. But many legal experts, former judges of the International Court of Justice and the International Criminal Court and organizations like Human Rights Watch all agree that Security Council approval is not required to conduct cross-border aid operations into Syria. Guterres has the power to activate disaster response mechanisms and dictate that international aid organizations and UN agencies use any crossing points with flexibility to deploy in northwest Syria. Will he heed the call for help? Or, or will he turn his back on civilians in northwest Syria once again? Sign the petition to tell Gutierrez, act fast, to respond to the earthquake disaster in northwest Syria. We'll put the link to the petition below the YouTube. Shouldn't we also demand that an airport be made ready in Idlib to receive humanitarian supplies. Why should Syrians be at the mercy of Turkish leaders who have their own agenda? Certainly there's an area that would be suitable for an airport, or perhaps there already is an airport that had been bombed out of action by Russia or Assad forces. Build or repair an airport in Idlib and put it under UN control and get it working fast. Back in 1948, the Berlin airport, it lasted for a year and airlifted 2.3 million tons of goods into West Berlin. And that was with technology of 70 years ago. Can't we respond to the immense and immediate needs of Syrians with a modern airlift? Save the date, Sunday the 26th. Syrian Rama Kudaimi will speak about Syria from civil war to earthquake for the Ukraine Socialist Solidarity Campaign. See the group's Facebook page for details. This is a quote from Russian journalist Maria Panomarenko just before she was sentenced for criticizing the bombing 
by the Russians of the theater in Mariupol, she told the court, no totalitarian regime has ever been as strong as before its collapse. On Saturday, February 25th, a fundraiser in person and on Zoom for the Ukrainian Mine Workers Union. Go to pepeace.org for details. And from Democracy Now!, a report about a glacier. In climate news, a team of researchers reports Antarctica's enormous Thwaites Glacier is on the verge of collapse, with warm water seeping under the weakest parts of the glacier and melting it from below. Researchers deployed a robotic submarine to penetrate the vast ice sheet, which is roughly the size of Florida. They found the glacier is susceptible to rapid and irreversible ice loss that could raise global sea levels by more than half a meter. Its collapse could destabilize surrounding glaciers that would raise the Earth's oceans by a further three meters, or nearly 10 feet. I read up a bit more about the Thawite Glacier. Apparently, the danger is not so much from melting, but from fracturing and breaking of this glacier into sections. It may not affect humans for many years, but the thought of a glacier the size of Florida disintegrating should shake us to our cores. She was then sentenced to six years in a penal colony. Now the final section of Human Rights Watch's Omar Shaker at Yale University's Dwight Hall Chapel. He was explaining HRW's conclusion that Israel practiced the international crime of apartheid. He demonstrated, one, intent to dominate, two, systematic oppression, and was beginning to talk about three, inhumane acts, starting with a focus on the West Bank. In the West Bank, Palestinians require permits to enter large sections of the West Bank, including East Jerusalem. So today, probably everybody in this room could take the train to New York, fly to Tel Aviv, and go to East Jerusalem, go to the old city. Not me, because the Israeli government kicked me out. Side note, probably the, the rest of you can't, right? But a Palestinian born and raised in the West Bank cannot go to East Jerusalem. Sometimes it's like a kilometer or two away. They're not allowed without a permit that's virtually impossible to obtain. Not only that, Israel has built, according to the UN, about, and this is circa a couple of years ago, 600, 593, I think is the exact number, closure obstacles and other checkpoints across the West Bank that can turn a short commute from home to school, school to hospital, into an hours long humiliating ordeal. On top of that, the Israeli government built a separation barrier, a wall in some places, that is largely built on Palestinian land and that separates Palestinian communities from hospitals, schools, one another, uh, access to water resources, thousands of Palestinians stuck on the wrong side of the separation barrier. So all that, the closure of Gaza, the checkpoints, the permit regime, the wall, inhumane act, number one. Inhumane act number two that we documented was the mass expropriation of Palestinian land. One third of the West Bank, more than two million dunams of land, we documented has been stolen from Palestinians and given to build illegal settlements and, and for land around settlements largely. 99% of the land that Israel um, has taken over as government land has been given, when given to civilians, 99% of that has gone to Jewish Israelis, not to Palestinians, right? Um, so this mass expropriation of land, it reduces Palestinians to living in uh, about a hundred and exact number for you, a hundred and sixty-five non-contiguous territorial islands, right? Because you keep taking land, taking land. So Palestinians, it's a Swiss cheese enclave of Bantistans or enclaves that they live in the West Bank, right? So number one, we said, right? We said uh, uh, movement restrictions, sweeping movement restrictions, two land expropriation. The third category of humane acts we documented are um, policies 
that home demolitions and other policies that lead Palestinians to leave their homes. Now, Israel makes it effectively impossible for Palestinians to get building permits in the majority of the West Bank under its exclusive control and in East Jerusalem. So according to government data, Israeli government data, between 2016 and 2018, the Israeli government issued 100 times more demolition orders than building permits for Palestinians in this part called Area C, the majority of the West Bank under its exclusive control. Every year, Israel demolishes hundreds of Palestinian homes, schools, uh, businesses for lacking a nearly impossible to get permit. This policy forces Palestinians out of their homes, and it amounts to forcible transfer, an inhumane act identified under the legal instruments. The fourth inhumane act we document are policies that have stripped Palestinians of their right to legally reside in their homes in the occupied Palestinian territory. So since 1967, the Israeli government has stripped more than half a million Palestinians of their right to live in the West Bank. Similar to what I described about Jerusalem with the example of the two Yale students, they've done that in the West Bank for Palestinians who were abroad for too long, weren't there when the occupation began. Again, people who live there, that's their home, whose right to live there was stripped on these arbitrary, unlawful bases. And fifth and finally, the last inhumane act we documented is the mass suspension of civil rights for the nearly five million Palestinians in the occupied Palestinian territory. What do I mean by this? For the 55 years that the Israeli army has ruled over the occupied Palestinian territory, Palestinians have not had the right to free expression, assembly, and association. Let's make this real. This gathering, if we were having it in Nablus, or in Ramallah, or in Bethlehem, would be illegal. Because under Israeli military law, any gathering of more than 10 people without a permit from the Israeli army can subject all of us to a 10-year jail sentence, just for this convenience. So that's not just a policy that affects young Palestinians, it affects them, their fathers, their grandfathers, their grandmothers, their, grand their mothers. So imagine 55 years of no civil rights. So let me conclude with a report by saying, when we put this all together, the intent to dominate that I started with, the systematic oppression, the inhumane acts, Human Rights Watch reached the apartheid determination. Now let me be very clear. This is the most stark assessment Human Rights Watch has ever reached on the conduct of Israeli authorities. It's not the only time we found crimes against humanity in the world. We found that the treatment, for example, of the Rohingya in Myanmar amounted to apartheid persecution. We found crimes against humanity in other places. I, um, as was noted in uh, my introduction, I documented crimes against humanity committed by the Egyptian government post-military coup in 2013 when they uh, killed uh, hundreds of protesters uh, after, the, um, the, um, after the military coup. Um, so our recommendations in the report are consistent with where we've reached these grave findings in other situations. I won't go in great depth other than to say we call for things like uh, investigating and prosecuting those that are implicated in these crimes, including at the International Criminal Court. We also call for ending all forms of complicity with these crimes. For example, um, military weapons that are going to facilitate, that are going to Israel, that help perpetuate these crimes. There should be, uh, those should stop so long as the repression continues. There are many, many other recommendations for businesses. Happy to discuss more. So let me sort of wind towards concluding, because I promised we'd have a lot of time for discussions, by sort of taking a step back and sort of getting down to where I started, right, which is why we did this research in, in the conversation, you know, here in the United States and academic freedom. So really our recommendations come down to a bit, sort of a basic set of uh, propositions, right? A 55-year occupation is not temporary. A more than 30 year, think about that, 30 year peace process alone is not enough to dismantle systematic repression, right? Denying millions of people their fundamental rights solely because they're Palestinian and not Jewish is not simply a matter of abusive occupation. Democracy is many things. 
But as my friend Hagayel Ad, the for director of Beth Salem, Israeli human rights group, says, democracy is the rule of the people, not the rule of one people over another. A context, a daily reality of structural violence and oppression is not a conflict between two equal sides. sides. A single system methodically engineered to ensure one people flourish and one people do not is not simply a matter of a conflict between two equal sides. The first step to solving any problem is to diagnose it correctly. Whether that's a doctor treating you at their office, or it's us trying to understand how to deal with the protracted situation of conflict. The wrong diagnosis leads to the wrong remedy, the wrong set of steps. Apartheid is not some hypothetical future scenario. You might not know that in 1974, Yitzhak Rabin, the former Prime Minister of Israel, warned about apartheid. In 2006, former President Jimmy Carter wrote a book, Palestine, Peace, Not Apartheid. In 2014, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry warned that we were a year or two away from apartheid. The threshold has been crossed. Palestinians have for years, for decades, been describing their lived reality as one of apartheid, but not enough of us listened. Apartheid is the daily reality for millions of Palestinians. By the way, this isn't simply the conclusion of Human Rights Watch. As Leila noted in her, in her introduction, Amnesty International also concluded that it was apartheid. So has the major human rights groups in Palestinian civil society, dozens of organizations. So has prominent Israeli human rights groups, including the flagship organization, Betsemi. Last month, on the first day the new Israeli government came to power, 27 Israeli human rights groups described apartheid, uh, used the word apartheid to describe Israel's treatment of Palestinians, Israeli human rights organizations. And by the way, it's not just these or NGOs. Harvard Law School's International Human Rights Clinic wrote a report last year saying it's apartheid. So did the UN expert in charge of the occupied Palestinian territory. So did the UN expert on discrimination and racism, many other UN experts. Even beyond the human rights movement, you now have a situation where you have prominent voices, right, from uh, you know figures in pop culture in the United States to professors like Lawrence Tribe, you know, at Harvard, Philippe Sands in the UK, the former, as Leila mentioned, the former Secretary Ban Ki Moon, the former UN Secretary General. You have former Israeli officials, including the former two, uh, two former Israeli ambassadors to South Africa, the former Director General of Israel's foreign ministry, the former attorney and deputy attorney general of Israel, all of whom have now said what we're doing to Palestinians is apartheid. And it's not just them. We now have entire governments, South Africa, which experienced apartheid, knows a thing or two about apartheid, has said the treatment of Palestinians is apartheid. So has Namibia that experienced that. So has last year in the Human Rights Council in Geneva, the entire African bloc of countries, the entire Arab bloc, and the entire organization of Islamic conferences all use the term apartheid to describe Israel's treatment of Palestinians. The reality is there is a burgeoning consensus around apartheid. But yet, here we are again. And maybe what I'm saying to you is new or it's challenging your assumptions. And I hope you'll ask me questions if that's the case. And that brings me to the topic that I'll really sort of conclude on, which is academic freedom. And I'll just say a few words and we can discuss more. Some of you may be aware, um, it was widely covered in the news, that Kenneth Roth, again, my former boss, uh, who uh, was one of my editors of the report that was published in April 2021, ran Human Rights Watch, one of the world's largest human rights organizations organizations for nearly 30 years. He stepped down last year, uh, and the Harvard uh, Carr Center for Human Rights at Harvard Kennedy School offered him a fellowship. Makes sense, he ran Human Rights Watch. You know, you're probably qualified to have a human rights fellowship at the Carr Center. They offered him a fellowship. He accepted the fellowship. Uh, he was getting ready to start at Harvard in the fall. Uh, he had a perfunctory meeting with the dean. The dean technically at the Harvard Kennedy School technically has, uh, you know, the right to veto an appointment. They had a 30-minute chat. 
Uh, during that chat, the dean of the Harvard Kennedy School asked Ken Roth, do you have any enemies? Ken said, I ran Human Rights Watch. Um, I have a lot of enemies, let me name them for you. Uh, China and Russia have banned me personally from entering the country. Uh, Saudi Arabia hates me, Rwanda, the Rwandan government hates me. You know, yeah, the Israeli government hates me too. By the way, parenthetically, as a side note, I've also been deported from four countries. So Israel's not alone in, in treating me this way. Syria, a block my entry, Egypt kicked me out, Ukraine kicked me out. Again, if you want stories, you know, save those for Q&A. The point of the story is if you work on human rights, you're not going to be the most beloved person. The dean vetoed Ken's fellowship. Harvard. And this only came in the media last month. It was reported in the Nation magazine by Michael Massing. There suddenly was a large outcry because apparently what the dean told professors at Harvard is that Human Rights Watch has an anti-Israel bias. Now, you know, professors at Harvard maybe aren't like professors at Yale, you know, they know a thing or two. So they presented research the dean about the ways in which Human Rights Watch is reporting is entirely consistent with the reporting of not only Amnesty International, but actually the very conclusions of the U.S. State Department uh, when it comes to many, many human rights issues. You know, obviously not the same, but you know, pretty consistent on a lot of metrics. Pressure was built, professors wrote letters, a lot of things happened, and two weeks ago, um, Ken Roth was, the dean acknowledged the mistake that was made, uh, apologized, and Ken was reauthorized the fellowship, and a week from today, he'll be arriving at Harvard to begin his fellowship at the Carr Center. But what happened to Ken is not exceptional, and it's not unique. Um, there's a report uh, from Palestine Legal, a great NGO, um, Disclosure, I was one of the co-authors before I joined Human Rights Watch and I worked at the Center for Constitutional Rights, called the Palestine Exception to the First Amendment. What happened to Ken has been happening to academics who are critical of Israel or speak out of Palestinian rights for years, for decades. And young academics, Palestinians, have faced the worst. Some of you in this audience may have faced it yourself for your um, activism. But why, is this, why, why I'm bringing this all up is things are changing. The threshold has also been crossed on academic freedom. Um, Harvard had to back down because the position of the dean was untenable. He was clearly pressured by somebody. He acknowledged that he made his decision because people who mattered to him wanted him to do this. But that was unsustainable. I'm here talking to you at Yale. There's a full house. I've been doing this in many other campuses. The conversation is shifting. The arc of history is bending. Now this is happening at the very same time that the situation on the ground is getting worse and worse by the day. So we live in this dichotomy. It's really, really bad. In many ways, the pressure on the ground is unprecedented. But at the same time, the conversation is shifting. And where I'll leave you with is our hope in many cases is all of you in the room today that you're going to raise your voice, that you're going to act. So let me just really end with my last sentence by saying, those in this audience who strive for Israeli and Palestinian peace, whatever you believe might be the way forward, the first step to getting there is to recognize the reality for what it is. Let's call a spade a spade, and let's bring to bear the sorts of human rights tools needed to get us to a better future. Thank you. That's our program for today. See you next week at this time. I'm Stanley Heller for the Struggle Video News.